Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hananiga High School. I'm Brian Brown, and today we'll be looking at the last couple sections of Chapter 11. Now, the first section deals with the structures of solids. Now, we can think of solids as falling into one of two main categories. Crystalline, which is what you're looking at here, in which the particles are in a highly ordered arrangement. And you can see in two and three dimensions, you have a very ordered pattern in that solid. Now, we can also sometimes have solids that are what are called amorphous arrangements. And here there is no particular order or uniform order throughout. Now, think about the consequences of this with what we've been talking about in this chapter, something like melting point or boiling point or intermolecular force. Well, if the arrangements aren't ordered, then the intermolecular forces won't be constant and ordered. And that's going to have an effect on its properties, like melting point. Now, with a crystalline solid like the first one we looked at here, since you have a very ordered arrangement, you have a very specific energy to your intermolecular force. And therefore, when you heat it up, you'll reach a certain temperature at which the particles have enough energy to break away. They're, they're at a high enough temperature, enough energy, but they just need more energy to overcome intermolecular forces. Well, they'll happen all at one specific temperature. So when you have a crystalline substance, basically you have a very specific melting point. You reach a certain temperature, and then all of your energy is going to break intermolecular bonds. Well, in an amorphous situation, you have different pockets of substances that really are at enough kinetic energy to break away. So it starts to melt or break apart in little sections. So instead of a definite melting point, you get a melting point range. So it begins to soften at a certain point. So you'd no, you'd no longer really totally call it a solid. Uh, but yet it's not really a liquid yet. And then eventually it would all melt and you would end up having a liquid at that point. So instead of a defined melting point, you'd end up with a melting point range. Now, one of the things that you should understand about how solids get put together is if it's a crystalline arrangement, it has to be following an ordered pattern. So because or there's an ordered nature of crystals, we can really focus on the repeating pattern that exists inside every substance around us. So on its simplest level, what is that pattern that gets repeated again and again in a larger structure for a crystalline substance? Well, that's what's called the unit cell. And there's primarily three fundamental types of unit cell. You've got the primitive cubic, you've got the body-centered cubic, where there's one at each corner and then one in the middle, and then you have the face-centered cubic, where you have one at each corner and then one on each face. So these are our fundamental ways in which our simplest pattern gets created and then gets repeated again and again and again throughout the crystalline solid. Now this is another way to image um, what we're talking about here. So on our far left we've got three different representations of what the simple cubic would look like and then we've got our body cubic, so one at each corner and one in the middle, and then on the far right we have our face centered cube, one on each corner and one in each face. Now, an implication of what you're seeing here is when we actually carve out our box, our cube here, not all of these atoms that you see are totally inside that box. And there's implications to that. Now, if you take a look at, let's say, a primitive cubic, a body-centered cubic, and a face-centered cubic at the actual sheared off edges of our cube, you can see that inside each situation, we actually have a different total number of atoms. Now on the far left in our primitive cube, we have basically one at each corner. Well, if you slice at the corner like that, you really have an eighth of an atom at each corner. And since we have eight corners on our box, that would really be a total of one atom is actually inside there. So if we look at the volume of the atom that's actually in our box, in the case of a primitive cubic, we just have one inside there. Now in the case of our bodied center, We've got our eight corners, which is going to be one at each spot, and then we have one in the center. So here we have a total of two atoms inside our cubic cell. And then in the last situation, in our face centered, since we have one at each corner, remember that's an eighth at each of the eighth corner, so that's a total of one, and then we have a half of an atom on each face, and we have six faces. So that would be a total of three for the face atoms, and then one at the corner for a total of four. So inside each situation, we've got one atom here, here we had two atoms, and here we actually had four atoms existing inside our um, actual unit cell. Now, if you take a look at something like NaCl, sodium chloride, this is what this uh, sodium chloride would look like on a, on a simple level. And in each case, we've got a very ordered pattern that you can see, but when we draw in our box, it gets a little bit easier to see what we actually have here. 
Now in the case of an, the NACL, and we'll look at really this representing that box over there, because notice we've got the green ones at the corner here. What we have is one at each corner. So we've got one at each corner all the way around. And then we have one on each face. So what we have here is a face-centered arrangement. So inside sodium chloride, from the sodium's point of view and from the chloride's point of view, we end up with a face-centered arrangement. So the type of unit cell in something like sodium chloride would actually be a face-centered arrangement. Now, take that to the next step um, and try and use this to do something real. Besides, you know, what is the shape going to look like on the large level? What else can we actually do with this idea? Well, we can determine the empirical formula of an ionic solid by looking at how many ions of each element fall within the unit cell. So if we take a look at something like sodium chloride, so let's go back to this picture here. Um, what we basically have is a situation where the chloride and the sodium were face-centered. Remember, this is our face-centered arrangement here. Now remember, if these are basically what we've got at the center, the face, the edge, the corner, um, we have to add these up to see really what we've got inside there. Well, if we add up the stuff, so you can see in the picture here, we've got our face-centered cubic. Um, if we add up things, we would see that we would have four of the sodiums, or I should say in this case, since it's going to match up with what we're looking at there, we basically have four of the chlorides inside there. So inside this arrangement, we've got four chlorides. Now, what have we got for the sodiums? Well, we have to go through and add that up as well. So if you look at our picture here, now, um, now we're looking at the purples in our box here. So we need to add up and see what we've got in each of these positions inside that unit cell. Well, we've got basically edge situations here on top. So we have four edges. Well, that's going to give us a total of one. And then if we look at the bottom, so what's going to happen on the bottom, we're going to have four edges there. That's going to give us another one, so we're at two. And then if you look around the middle, so one here, one here, one here, and then one in back, that's going to give us another four edges. That's going to be another one. And then in the very middle of this picture is a purple one that you don't see. On the previous picture, it was a little bit easier to see. We were looking at the unit cell from the chloride's point of view. In the middle was a purple sodium. Well, it's one whole thing on the inside, so that's going to give us one more. Well, that adds up to a total of four. So we've got four chlorides in the unit cell, and we have four sodiums. Well, put that together. What's the empirical formula of sodium chloride going to be? Since we've got the four chlorides and the four sodiums, that would be a total of basically one to one. So from our unit cell, we can actually see if we can look at what's inside our unit cell and understand whether it's face-centered or body-centered, we can actually compare the number of ions of each thing, and we can determine the empirical formula. So that would be one application of this. Last section, 11.8, gets into bonding of solids. Now, we talked about the different strengths of attractions of intermolecular forces, and we looked at five of those. Well, we also have intramolecular forces, and that's what we're looking at here. These are our intramolecular attractions. Now, the ones we've spent the most time with in previous years of chemistry, we talked about molecular things, that would be covalently bonded substance. We talked about ionic things, that would be metals with nonmetals, so we got positive and negative ions. And then finally, when we have metallic atoms, or even an alloy with a mix of metallic substances, we've got metallic bonding existing inside there. So we really talked about these three types of intramolecular forces um, in pre-AP chemistry. The one we really haven't talked much about, and this is actually a very strong type of intramolecular attraction, is a covalent network. Now, it's called covalent network because we have substances, atoms, inside here that are covalently bonded together in every direction. Ionic bonding is a very strong force because electrostatic attractions are strong, and it's a three-dimensional force. I mean, it exists strong in every direction. Well, covalent network is very much like that. You have a network of covalent bonds in every direction. So the whole substance is held together by strong intramolecular forces. So covalent network is another strong type of uh, bonding, just like ionic is. And you can see from the properties that are listed here how the strengths of these uh, tend to vary. Molecular tend to be lower in overall strength, um, whereas covalent and ionic tend to be very hard. 
And then metallic is kind of all over the place. Sometimes it's soft, uh, but typically it's very hard. Uh, but it tends to vary more depending on the types of metallic bonding that you get. So some things are much more strongly held together than others. Mercury, it's a liquid at room temperature, so you know it's not near as strongly held together as something like gold atoms, which are, are a solid. But even gold is still relatively soft. But there are many different types of um, metallic substance that come together that get significantly harder than gold. So they tend to vary more, but, but on average, I would say they tend to be a little bit stronger up there, closer to covalent and ionic. Now, the covalent network I mentioned was strong because it's a 3D covalent network that's bonding in every single direction. So diamond would be a good example of that. It's a covalent network solid. Carbon substances do this. So carbon substances, silicon substances, and silicon dioxide, like silicon dioxide or silicon monoxide, um, these are relatively rare. So if you see basically carbon, silicon, or silicon oxide, it's going to be covalent network. Those are about the only instances you're ever, ever, ever going to see. And what happens is you have an intramolecular force in every direction. So it's a very strong type of force. Diamond is an incredibly hard type of substance because of that network covalent 3D bonding. And that's what you'd see with diamond is what's on the left there. Now graphite, another way to put carbon together, is also co covalently bonded in multiple directions. You just don't have quite as strong of an arrangement in graphite. Within the plate, so the carbon atoms that exist on the plate here, you have a strong covalent bonding between them. So the plates themselves are very strongly covalently network held together. But in between the plates, you have relatively weaker covalent bonding occurring. And that's why these plates can move against each other. And they actually move against each other with very little friction. So graphite is a very different type of substance because of how the covalent network is happening differently in these two, three substances. So really what we have here is some delocalized pi bonding occurring within the plate, which is a pretty strong arrangement. And then we have weakly bonded sheets together. And those are held together by much stronger London dispersion forces. So the plates themselves are held together very strongly and are very rigid, but movement between the plates is held together by much weaker London dispersion forces. Now, graphite, because the fact that you can have moving electrons in our delocalized pi bonding in each seat, um, tends to be a pretty good conductor, which is something that you wouldn't assume is going to be ever true of something like a nonmetal. Typically, they're not good conductors. Graphite has to be an exception to that. Um, another thing that's true is it's, it's a good lubricant because of the weak forces between sheets. Those sheets can move fast each against, or can move against each other, and actually with very, very little friction. So for something that has, you know, such hard, rigid plates, it's actually a fairly good lubricant between things because of the weaker nature of the London forces between the bonds. Um, in general, covalent network things um, are going to be hard. Now, graphite itself has hard components and soft components, but diamond itself is very, very hard. And these things are both going to have very high melting points because it's really hard to break apart that strong covalent web. Now, molecular solids, some of our, our weakest things. Um, and that's because they're held together by much weaker van der Waals forces. So they're held together by intramolecular forces, not intramolecular forces, like our covalent network and like our ionic bonding and even our metallic bonding. So these things tend to have uh, much lower melting points and be much softer. And that's because they're held together by those weaker London dispersion forces. You can have different types of molecular solids, but fundamentally in every one of these pictures, what we have are weaker forces holding them together. Um, sometimes it's London forces, sometimes it's hydrogen bonding, sometimes it's dipole-dipole, but those are all on the order of magnitude much stronger or much more weakly held together than intramolecular bonding is. Now, metallic solids, you may remember last year, is like uh, um, the, it, it's, it's referred to as the electron C model. And a demo I often do with my students with this is I have them say, you're sitting in very rigid rows, so you're like a solid. Now, you're going to be a metallic solid like sodium, so you're going to have one valence electrons that you don't want. You're not stable if you have that one valence electron. So what you do is you throw your pencil into the middle. Once you do that, you've lost an electron, so now you're positively charged. But as a positively charged object, you are attracted to that electron that's nearby. Now, not so attracted that you're going to take it and bring it back into the atom, because then that would lower your stability, and that's a higher potential energy, unstable situation. So while you're attracted to and will hold on to the electrons, you don't localize it. You don't pull it back into the structure. 
So if those pencils were free to run around the room and everybody were to hold on to them, we would have metallic bonding. Now, these, this can be a weak arrangement, so it can be soft um, with low melting point, but typically these tend to be much stronger in ionic bonding because of the movements of the electron. They're very good conductors. And because of the mobile nature of the bonding, you can push these cations all over the place and they'll be still attracted to the nearby electrons, so they're very malleable. And that ends our last set of notes from chapter 11.